Good morning and welcome to New Hanover County Schools The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Dermamy. And I'm Britton Kilborn. This week, this is the week of April 27th through May 3rd. This week, the, sh the running topic of our show is safety. There are a wide variety of safety topics and we cover a few important ones in today's show. We have special safety segments, safety trivia, and we'll play a fun safety game to close the show. In addition, we have Math Fun 101. Today, our middle school math coach has a fun and challenging problem centered on weight. And we have a new episode of Green Revolution. This week we'll learn how a new design in roofs can play a big part in lowering energy use and improving water management. It's going to be a great show, but for now let's check in with our news anchor who is standing by with, with our first look at your school news headlines. Good morning. Good morning, Sierra and Britton, and welcome everyone to your school news here on The Morning Show. Topping the headlines this week, students win at History Day event Teachers are finalists in an e-learning award, and tonight students make annual visit to Keenan House. I will have all those stories and more coming up later in the show. We get things going today with a staple here on the morning show with a segment we call This Week in History. Our Grand Masters of Historical Knowledge has all the headlines for, from past times in This Week in History, brought to you by Kidsville News. <laughs> Welcome to This Week in History. I'm your historical host, Samantha Klein, covering all the colorful and amazing events that have left their mark on history's timeline. This is the week of April 27th through May 3rd. April 27th, 1994. More than 22 million South Africans turn out to cast ballots in the country's first multiracial parliamentary elections. An overwhelming, overwhelming majority chose anti-apartheid leader Nelson Mandela to head a new coalition government that included his African National Congress Party, the former President's National Party, and the Zulu's Freedom Party. April 28, 2004. Comcast, America's largest cable operator, abandoned its $54 billion hostile takeover bid for the Walt Disney Company in the, faces, in the face of faltering stock prices and Disney's continued refusal to entertain the proposal. April 29, 1992. A jury in Los Angeles acquits four police officers who had been charged with using excessive force in arresting black motorist Rodney King a year earlier. The announcement of the verdict, which, ra which enraged the black community, prompted widespread riots throughout much of the sprawling city. It wasn't until three days later that the arson and looting finally ended. April 30th, 1927. The Federal Industrial Institution for Women, the first women's federal prison, opens in West Virginia. All women serving federal sentences of more than a year were to be brought there. The prison buildings, prison's buildings were each named after social reformers and it sat atop 500 acres. One judge described the prison as a fashionable boarding school. May 1st, 1931. President Herbert Hoover officially dedicates New York City's Empire State Building, pressing the button from the White House that turns on the building's lights. Hoover's gesture, of course, was symbolic. While the president remained in Washington, D.C., someone else flicked the switches in New York. Finally, your weekend history tidbits. May 2, 2005. Billionaire mogul Martha Stewart is released from a federal prison in West Virginia after serving five months for lying about her sale of I'm Clone stock in 2001. After her televised ex exit from the facility, Stewart flew on a charter jet to New York, where she would serve out her remaining five-month home confinement on her 153-acre Bedford, New York estate. May 3rd, 1963, the Hula Hoop, a hip-swiveling toy that became a huge fad across America when it was first marketed by Whammo, in 1958 is patented by
by the company's co-founder, Arthur Spud Mellon. An estimated 25 million hula hoops were sold in its first four months of production alone. That's This Week in History. Your ultimate source for those key moments in time. I'm Samantha Klein. Thanks for stopping by. This Week in History is brought to you by Kidsville News, a fun and effective learning resource for children, teachers, and parents. It features school news, information, and local community events while promoting literacy and the development of good reading habits, character traits, and study skills in young children. And Kidsville News is always free. Copies are delivered every month to every elementary school in the New Hanover County system. And join us again next time for another journey through time as we explore the fun, fascinating, entertaining, and educational facts that make up this week in history. Now don't go away, we'll be right back. What state am I? Over 80% of my state are covered by forest. The purple finch is my state bird. My nickname is the Granite State. Do you know who I am? If you've guessed New Hampshire, you're right. I received statehood in 1788. This United States factoid has been brought to you by New Hanover County Schools on the Learning Network of the Cape Fear. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Dummermuth. And I'm Britton Kilborn. Today we dedicate our show to safety. There are too many safety tips on too many topics for us to cover in one show. However, we are going to take a look at a few important topics for you at home. We begin with a feature for young students and their parents, as well as anyone who could use a refresher on bicycle safety. Later in the show, we will share tips for cooking safety. And as we mentioned in the opening, we have an exciting game at the end of the show, which will test our knowledge on poison prevention. For now, here are Xander and Elizabeth to show us how to bike safety and bike smart. Bike, bike safe, bike, bike smart. smart. My name is Xander. And my name is Elizabeth. Over the next few minutes, we're going to have some fun and talk about some pretty important stuff. Some of it you've heard before, but it never hurts to hear it again. And again. And again. So here we go. This is about you, your bike, and the rules of the road. Because we want you to bike safe and bike smart. Bike, bike safe. safe. Bike smart. As long as we're on the subject of smart, let's start with your head. Good idea. Your head is where your brain lives, and you need your brain for a lot of things. Did you know that just falling off your bike is enough to get a serious brain injury? So play it safe. Wear your helmet every time you ride. It can reduce the risk of head injury by up to 85%. And that's a lot. The helmet should be snug on your head and sit flat. The strap should form a V under your ear, and the chin strap should also be snug. Two fingers should fit in between your eyebrow and your helmet. Also, make sure your helmet meets safety standards. Look for a sticker that says CPSC. This stands for the Consumer Product Safety Commission. Now that your head and brain are protected, we can talk about how to ride safely. Did you know that bikes are considered vehicles? Meaning you have to follow the same rules as someone driving a car. That means when you ride in the street, ride in a straight line with traffic on the right side of the road. Riding against traffic is dangerous. It puts you where the driver of a car isn't expecting you. And if you're riding with friends, always ride single file. And here's something else to remember. Always obey traffic lights and signs, and pay attention to lane markings. When you see one of these, stop. When you see one of these, yield. Traffic might be coming from one side or the other. Now, since your bike doesn't come with turn signals, use your hands. But always check for traffic before you turn. Do this to turn left, this to turn right, 
Also, some states allow you to do this to turn right. And do this to stop. Did you know that 70% of car or bicycle crashes happen at driveways or intersections? So before you enter a street, stop, look left, right, then left again. And use caution at intersections. Be careful. Don't be a statistic. Hey, now a word about staying alert. If you're riding your bike, leave your headphones at home or stick them in a backpack because if you put them on your head, you won't be able to hear the traffic around you. Bike, bike safe, bike, bike smart. smart. Here are a few other things to remember to make your next ride a safe one. Communicate with motorists by making eye contact or waving. That way both of you know you can see each other. Don't swerve in and out of parked cars and always ride far enough away to avoid the unexpected. Like eating a car door. Always check behind you before turning or changing lanes. Be courteous to pedestrians. Keep your eyes open for things on the road like litter, potholes, gravel, railroad tracks, and storm grains. Can you see me? How about me? It's more difficult to ride at night, but if you have to, make sure you can be seen. Check this out. I'm wearing white, but it's not enough because I'm still difficult to see. No matter what time of day you ride, always wear bright clothing. But at night, you really need to wear reflective or retroreflective gear. If you don't have any, Buy some retroreflective tape and put it on your shoes, your jacket, and your helmet. It helps reflect light back to the driver of a car. Make sure your bike has reflectors. And you need a headlight and a tail light. That's the best way to get noticed in the dark. And it's the law. Remember, the sooner a driver can see you and recognize you, the sooner they can react. Thanks for all that great information, Xander and Elizabeth. Keep these tips in mind when you are out biking and remember to have stressed them if you have young bikers with you. All right, it's time now to send it over to the news desk for more Your School News and Our School News with Our School News anchor, Rachel Glue, who is standing by. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to Your School News on The Morning Show. I'm Rachel Glue. New Hanover County School students recently participated in the Cape Fear Museum's History Day event. This year's theme was Leadership and Legacy in History, with a complete list of students who now qualify for North Carolina History Day competition in Raleigh is YSN reporter Heather Jensen. The Cape Fear Museum hosted 195 students competing in the 2015 National History Day Southeastern Regional NC District competition. National History Day encourages students to engage in an educational and historical experience to make the past come alive. Contestants presented their work in front of a group of judges and had the chance to teach others about their research. Winning this year in the Junior Division Individual Documentaries was Maya Bryant from Milliston and the Junior Division Group Documentaries was Emma Rose Phillips and Ava Johnson from Milliston taking first place and Malik Binot, Anderson Smith, Griffith, Warren, and Bailey Rogers were also from Williston, taking third place. In the senior division individual documentaries, Don Duke from New Hanover High School took first place, while taking second place in the senior division group documentaries were Leela King, Eleni Stoikos, Mary Manon, Mary Mann, and Cram from also from New Hanover. In the historical papers category, Ella Koch from Milliston took first place in the junior division, while Hannah White and Dupress Zumbro from New Hanover High School took first and third place, respectively. Williston Middle School students Emerson Woolline and Cora Willis took first and second place in the junior division of individual web pages, while Sam Anderson from New Hanover High School took first in the senior division individual web pages. Still in the web pages category, third place in the junior division group web pages went to Haley Rose and Gabby Douglas from Murray Middle School. 
while second and third place in the senior division group webpages went to Ben Meyer, Kate Spencer, and Tally Thompson, Colette Penigre, Joshua Turnage, and Claire Hines from New Hanover High School. The performance category was dominated by New Hanover High School. Cameron Howard took first place in the individual per performances, while Brittany Pecoro and Hassler Robertson took first place in the group performances. Finally, junior division group exhibits winners were Katie Gestickler and Matthew Rivenbark from Noble Middle School. This regional competition inspired middle and high school students to, to venture outside the classroom and participate in an in-depth learning experience. Students took on the roles of researchers, developers, and specialists while creating their projects. The 2015 competition theme was Leadership and Legacy in History. Students from this year's competition will now compete in the state event on April 25th in Raleigh. Reporting for Your School News, this is Heather Jensen. Wendy Kraft, Supervisor of Online Learning for New Hanover County Schools, and Jessica Milligan, Virtual Academy Coordinator at Hoggard High School, have been named finalists in the first annual North Carolina Virtual Public School 2015 eLearning Advisor slash eLearning Coordinator of the Year Award. Out of the 115 districts in North Carolina that use NCVPS, the state identified 19 of the most impactful e-learning advisors slash e-learning coordinators. Four of the 19 were from New Hanover County Schools, and two of the three finalists chosen to move on to Phase 2 in the selection process are NHCS educators. NCVPS will announce the Coordinator of the Year in May. Recent research produced by a task force task force of psychologists and educational researchers associated with the National Association for Gifted Children indicated that high ability students are generally at least as well adjusted as any other group of youngsters. However, the research also found that gifted and talented students can face a number of situations that may constitute sources of risk to their social and emotional development. To focus on and discuss this topic in depth, a special AIG workshop featuring Dr. Richard Courtright, a gifted education specialist for Duke Tip, entitled Social and Emotional Characteristics of High Ability Children and Youth, was held at Coddington Elementary. Focus in academics so much on the cognitive. This is about how kids feel internally, the emotional, and then interactions with others, the social component of what they experience sometimes when they get to school and at home as well. Topics covered in the workshop included the myths and truths of giftedness and the theory of emotional development. Dr. Courtright broke down the positive characteristics of the gifted, both the cognitive aspects and the emotional side of the gifted student and how the two work together. During his presentation, Courtright pointed out to the parents that the Columbus Group, which operates a National Gifted Development Center, has indicated that the uniqueness of the gifted renders them particularly vulnerable and requires modifications in parenting, teaching, and counseling in order for them to develop optimally. It was an informative workshop for parents. For all the latest on New Hanover County Schools, join us weekdays at 5.30 p.m. here on Time Warner Cable Channel 5 and Charter Cable Channel 919 for your school news, a complete half hour of all the latest news and information from New Hanover County Schools. Now back to our hosts. Thanks, Rachel. Math Fun 101 is a brief yet very useful math lesson, producing conjugation with and, with and hosted by middle school math coaches and teachers. This segment takes a look at, at an everyday problem and how to solve it. The segment also gives us a little bit of information we can use to solve similar problems in our own lives. This week, Rylan Red from Roland Grice Middle School has a fun problem concerning weight. I'm Ryan Red. Welcome to Math Fun 101. Today we have a cool math problem we're going to work on and then we're going to talk about how it applies to your life. So if we go to the board, I have two triangles and my question is, would I rather push a 20 pound box up this triangle or would I rather push a 20 pound box up this triangle? Well, 
but just by looking at it, I can tell that this triangle has, a, it's, it's a bit steeper, and I can tell that this side's gonna be a bit longer, but I don't know for sure until I figure out the length of each side. So I do know that I'm dealing with two right triangles, and the way that I know that is because I have two perpendicular lines that form a right angle. So I know that this is a right angle, and I know that this is a right angle, therefore this is a right triangle. And I know that when I have a right triangle, I can use the Pythagorean theorem to find the missing side length, or the missing leg of a, a right triangle. So. I know that I can use the Pythagorean theorem, which is a squared plus b squared equals c squared. And the box that I wanna push up is actually on, it's on the leg that's called the hypotenuse, and in our uh, theorem, that is c. So that's our missing length. I'm going to leave it c squared. And then A and B stand for the two legs. And the two legs are the legs of the triangle, the right triangle that surround the right angle. So I'm gonna take three, I'm gonna square that, and then I'm gonna take five, and I'm gonna square that as well. And now it's just like an equation that we begin to solve. So I know three squared is nine, and I know five squared is 25, and that is going to be equal to C squared. So now I need to add nine and 25, which I know is 34. And I have not found C yet because what I'm looking for is a number times itself that equals C. And to, get, to do that, I do the inverse of squared, which is square root. So I square root C, and then I'm gonna have to square root 34, and I end up with five and eight tenths meters. So I know that this side length is five and eight tenths meters long. Okay, so I have my one side of my first triangle. Now I need to find the other side of my other triangle. So I'm going to apply the same theorem, which is the Pythagorean theorem. And I know again, I'm looking for my hypotenuse. So all I need to do is leave C as C squared and then plug in my information, my values. So here I have three squared plus 11 squared is equal to C squared. And I know three times three is nine, and 11 times 11 is 121, and the sum of my legs will equal the uh, side squared, so that's going to be 130, is equal to c squared. And again, to make sure that I find the number that um, is multiplied by itself to give me c, I take the square root of 130, and that gives me 11 and 4 tenths. So this side is equal to 11 and 4 tenths um, meters. So now I have the decision, do I wanna push this 20 pound box up a steep, 5.8 meter um, hill or an 11.4 that doesn't seem to have as much as of a slope. So I think that would be up to you to decide if you could push it up really fast or you could take your time but it wouldn't be as, um, it wouldn't be as steep as the other triangle. So the question about the Pythagorean theorem is when do you apply that in everyday life? So anytime you have a right triangle and you have a missing side length, you know that you can always use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out that side length. So if I have a garden that's a right triangle and I wanna put it up against a fence and another um, board, and then I need to define the diagonal length, you can use that. Um, the diagonal length of TVs or iPads, that information is all given using the Pythagorean theorem. So those are some different applications of how you would use Pythagorean theorem in everyday life. Thank you, Ms. Red. Now don't go away. This rip-roaring edition of the morning show will continue right after this break. 
But before we go, we have our trivia question of the day. Our show's theme is safety, and one of the biggest safety concerns in our lives are car accidents. Car accidents happen all the time and anywhere. About 10 million people are involved in car accidents each year. Car accidents are even the leading cause of death for teenagers. Our trivia question today asks, which of the following is the number of cause, number one cause of car accidents? A, drunk driving, B, distracted driving, C, speeding, or D, aggressive driving. We'll have the answer when we return. This is Lands and People, your passport to the world. The Commonwealth of Australia is located in the Southern Hemisphere between the Indian and Pacific Oceans. Australia's capital is Canberra and the country's three major languages are English, Aboriginal languages and Chinese. Industries include mining, food processing and steel production. Australia is also the only continent occupied solely by one nation. This has been Lands and People, your passport to the world. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Dumruth and my co-host is Britton Kilborn. Safety takes center stage on our show today. And before, we break, before the break, we asked our trivia question, which was about driving safety. The trivia question asked, which of the following is the number one cause of car accidents? A, drunk driving, B, distracted driving, C, speeding, or D, aggressive driving? And the correct answer is B, distracted driving. Being distracted while driving is the number one cause of vehicle accidents in America and is the cause of 25 to 50 percent of all accidents. Distractions to a driver can include texting, talking, reading, fatigue, eating, grooming, and looking around. Yes, it is no major cause of accidents. If you are using a phone to text while operating a motor vehicle, it is 23 more times likely, likely for you to get in a wreck. Not only does distracted driving put you and your passengers in harm's way, it can also hurt innocent bystanders. Distracted driving can be very deadly, so please only pay attention to what's in front of you on the road instead of things like your cell phone or friends in the back seat. It's not worth losing your life over. Shifting gears now, we feature an edition of the award-winning Green Revolution. The series takes a look at the new ways science and technology can provide the necessary foundation for our future in a world powered by clean energy. In today's episode, a green roof can certainly make a building look nicer, but can it measurably lower energy requirements and improve water management? Researchers hope that architects will someday use their model to make a building designs even greener. These days, most of us pay attention to how we live. We recycle, we try to use less water and electricity, we walk or bike or drive more efficient cars. But a lot of us never really think about where we live or work or go to school. I mean, a building is a building, right? Not necessarily. Let's say you grow a bunch of plants on top of your building and they use sunlight and water and carbon dioxide just like they're supposed to. Suddenly, you've decreased your energy bill, reduced air and water pollution, and made things a little greener. Places all over the world have tried it. So why aren't there more green roofs? Well, is it worth the extra work? It makes sense that plants on a roof would keep the building cooler, even if they only provide a little shade. But what's really going on? Where's the heat energy going? How does a green roof change the way a building transfers heat? So that simple question uh, led us on to a 10-year chase. Yelena Schrebrich is an architectural engineer at Penn State University who studies energy flow in and around buildings. She and her students built their own green roof, but with their model, they can control the weather to test what really happens when sun, rain, wind, and plants all work together on the roof of a building. But experiments don't always go as planned. Our first facility was so poorly designed that uh, it caught accidentally on fire and we had to remove it. <laughs> but it was a great learning experience. Just because you're a talented engineer doesn't mean you have a green thumb. Plants do die, <laughs> they get sick, they need maintenance. So they went to an expert. Rob Brigage is a horticulturist. 
He knows all about plants. So Yelena mentioned that they actually killed a lot of different plants when they were trying to figure out what would grow really well on a roof. Can you explain to us a little bit about how you help them choose the right plants for a roof setting? Okay. So, so the plants we pick are adapted to growing in a harsh environment. What we're really trying to achieve is something that is more or less in balance. So you said 50% of the water that would normally have run up is actually taken up by the plants and put back into the atmosphere. How do the plants do that? It's called evapotranspiration and it's a, it's a normal process that all plants go through. They take water up and they release it into the atmosphere. Evapotranspiration is one reason a green roof keeps a building cooler in the summer. Instead of being absorbed by the building, heat from the sun is transferred to water in the plants and soil and released to the atmosphere. Okay, so we've got a lab. The plants are alive and well. What's next? One of the major questions we wanted to answer was what's the best way to analyze our data or collect the data for the first place. So you, you wanted to recreate some of the conditions that might be outdoors in the lab and then try to measure the different variables? Right. Well, yes. for part of the, it's a lot easier to start on a small scale than it is to just go gung-ho at a big project. So if we understand a small scale, the plan is to move it to a bigger scale and just adjust our finding. We're taking measurements, some, some sensors take them every second, some take every minute, okay. but we're always monitoring data. Okay. So they take that data, everything they know about that small space, and identify all the factors that affect energy flow. With all these numbers, they can start to figure out how the energy moves within the system. Then another lab member, Paulo Tabarez Velasco uses math to take what they learned from the lab and turn it into a computer model to explain what happened in their experiment and predict what will happen in the real world. So, Paulo, we saw a lot of the different in, uh, instrumentation you had in the lab and the measurements that you were taking. How did you take the, the numbers and all the data you got there and make it into a model you might be able to use to predict what was happening outside? That's something very interesting. You first, we do a statistical analysis of the data, we take average of that data, and then we put it into our model to make sure that our model is predicting the right type of phenomena. In other words, we compare what our model says with the actual data. So you have to start simple and then make it more complex as that's you correct. understand the simple parts. Yes, more. that's correct. Everybody knows it's cooler in the shade, but how do you prove it? What's different between a green roof and a regular roof? It may not matter to a lot of people. All they know is that their buildings are cooler and they're saving money. But NSF funds people who want to know more. Engineers like Yelena and Tyler and Paolo who build models and invent ways to test their ideas. Ideas that future architects and designers can use to make buildings that will change our world for the better. And sometimes the best place to start is at the top. Now, if you'd like to watch this video again or learn more about discovering energy, you can visit the website, www.nsf.gov slash Green Revolution. All right, it's time now for this week's lunch menu. This is a menu for Monday, April 27th through Monday, May 4th. On Monday, April 27th, energize yourself with chicken alfredo and a breadstick, a French bread pizza, or a deluxe chicken sandwich. On the side, pile on garden peas, glazed sweet potatoes, a garden salad, or mixed fruit. Then on Tuesday, April 28th, stuff yourself with spaghetti and meatballs with a breadstick, chicken cheese steak, or a cheeseburger. Complement your entree with lima beans, a garden salad, and fresh fruit. On Wednesday, April 29th, be sure to enjoy barbecue chicken with a biscuit cheesy breadsticks, or popcorn chicken with a roll. Side items include pasta salad, sweet potatoes, a healthy garden salad, and diced peaches. On Thursday, April 30th, visit your school's cafeteria for a turkey club sandwich, egg rolls with fried rice, or a pepperoni pizza hoagie. As you traverse the lunch line, add the wonderful side items of oriental vegetables, a garden salad, and fresh fruit. 
Then on Friday, May 1st, energize yourself with a healthy lunch of either fish nuggets, macaroni and cheese, or nachos grande. No matter what entree you choose, they all feature the wonderful side item of a roll or cornbread muffin, tomato and cucumber salad, a garden salad, and applesauce. Finally, on Monday, May 4th, awaken your taste buds with flavor-packed beef a with a breadstick, corn puppies, or a chicken filet sandwich. Continue your explosion of flavor with a side items of sweet potato waffle fries, a garden salad, and spiced apples. And there you have the lunch menu for the week. Don't forget, you can also start your day off with a healthy and hearty breakfast at school. We now have an important feature for younger students and their parents, as well as anyone who could use a few tips on safety while cooking. These tips are brought to you by FEMA and the Norwell Fire Department. Guess it's my turn to clean up. And I'll be scrubbing extra hard because I want to make sure I get all the spilled food off the stove. That's because a hot burner can easily ignite grease and food that has splashed out of the pan. Spilled food inside an oven or microwave is bad too. Looks like this one is overdue for a cleanup. But it isn't just splattered grease and spilled food that can start a fire. It's pretty much anything that can burn. Like this hand towel, for example. Every time I get ready to cook, I start the recipe with a clean sweep of the stove area. I move anything that could burn off the stovetop and a good distance away from it. Don't forget to look around the stove, too. If paper towels, curtains, or anything else that can burn is too close, it's a good idea to move it. Spices too close to the burners, oil, or other items near the stove should be moved. These things may seem harmless, but all of them can catch fire. And now it's time to clean. I don't want to hear about it from the rest of the squad. Wow, we had a big group of preschoolers visiting the station today. They were really great kids and I think they learned a lot about fire safety. I've got a couple of kids myself, and I do worry about them. That's because very young children have a higher risk of getting burned, and not just by fire. The kitchen is an especially dangerous area. From the time my kids were little, I taught them to stay well away from the stove. Kids can suffer terrible burns by reaching up and touching a burner or pulling a hot pot down onto themselves. A smart way to prevent that kind of tragedy is to measure a kid-free zone all around the stove and cooktop. We let our kids mark the borders with bright tape until they learn the distance by heart. Make the zone at least three feet so the cook has plenty of space and the kids are out of danger from spills. It's not easy raising children. Having a kid-free zone gives parents one less thing to worry about. Of course, we still need to keep a close eye on them. That's my cue, I gotta run. I love to cook, don't you? I have a great meal planned for the squad tonight, and I sure don't want to ruin it by ending up with a burn. In my job, I see burn injuries every day and some of them cause a lifetime of pain and scarring. The good news is that burn injuries are easily prevented. I keep oven mitts and potholders ready to help protect against burns. I always wear short sleeves or roll up my sleeves to keep my shirt away from the hot burner. The stove isn't on yet, but you can see how a long, loose sleeve could catch fire. And I'm especially careful with steam. It's ready. Look at this popcorn you can see that a lot of steam has built up. Always uncover heated food so the steam goes away from you. Hot liquids can scald a child in only seconds, so families with young children need to take a few extra steps. It's just too dangerous to hold a child and try to drink a cup of coffee at the same time. 
always check hot food before you give it to the kids because you can't count on them to check it for themselves. If you are burned, put a minor burn under cool water, not cold, for three to five minutes. Get medical treatment right away for a serious burn. See, it's easy to prevent burns. Thanks for those important safety tips. They were excellent. For more safety tips, visit www.usfa.fema.gov. Now, as we head into break, here is our feature on an important philosopher. This week, we look at Thomas Hobbes. This segment was written, produced, and edited by Laney High School senior Heather Jensen. Stay tuned, and we'll be right back. Thomas Hobbes was an English philosopher in the 17th century who was famous for his critical and political views on society. Hobbes gained knowledge in many fields like mathematics, translation, and law. He was also well known for his writings and disputes on religious subjects. Hobbes was also a respected theorist in ethics and politics. In 1642, Hobbes published De Kive, his first book on political philosophy. But his most famous book was Leviathan, this book especially articulated political philosophy. Hobbes said that the government was used primarily as a device for ensuring collective security. The state is created by humans, so he first describes human nature. He says that in each, in each one of us can be found a representation of general humanity and that all aspects are ultimately self-serving. In a state of nature, humans would behave completely selfishly. He also said that humanity's natural condition is a state of perpetual war, fear, and amorality, and that only government can hold a society together. Thomas Hobbes believed in absolutism. He thought an effective government must have absolute authority. The government's powers must be neither divided nor limited. He thought a monarchy is best form of government. Hobbes also believed that all phenomena in the universe can be explained in terms of motions, and interactions of material bodies. He did not believe in the soul. He maintained that the constant back and forth mediation between the emotion of fear and the emotion of hope is the defining principle of all human actions. Either fear or hope is present at all times in all people. Thomas Hobbes was a classically trained questioner, a theorist who had doubt that in turn sprouted discoveries. He was a contributor to society in this way. Now it's time for This Week in Bad Stats. Bad stats? Horrible stats. Here goes. 132. That's how many batters struck out four times in one game last season. Wow, very good. Here's a tough one, though. Three and four. No idea. That's how many kids have witnessed bullying. Three out of four. That's not a good stat. No, it's not. But it can change. Kids want to help, but they don't know how. Visit StopBullying.gov and give them the tools they need to help prevent bullying. There are plenty of safe ways kids can help at StopBullying.gov. Welcome back to The Morning Show. I'm Sierra Dermuth and my co-host is Britton Kilborn. It, it is time for NC's Happenings. Everyone should get out their pen and paper as we take a trip across the states and look at all the events taking place in the coming months. Whether you're looking for adventure or re relaxation, mountains or beaches, the rhythm of city life or the tranquility of nature, there's something happening for everyone here in North Carolina. Day May 1st. Place Pender County Courthouse. Event Pender County Spring Festival. Meet in the Courthouse Square for a homegrown, homemade festival featuring Pender County vendors, churches, and nonprofits with that what will provide a variety of foods and baked goods. If you have any questions, please call 259-4844 or send an email to Rochelle Furniture at BellSouth.net. Date May 7th through May 10th. Place Black Mountain, Event Leaf, 
Lake Eden Arts Festival. Leaf is one of the treasured traditions for families and friends across the Southeast. A weekend at Leaf is the equivalent of going on a year-long multicultural music, arts, dance, and outdoor adventures journey, which recharges our batteries. Admission is $15 and kids 10 and under are free. If you have any questions, you can call 828-686-8742 or go to www.theleaf.com. Day May 16th through 17th, Place Wilmington, Event 10th Anniversary, Rims on the River Vintage Car and Hot Rod Show. From 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., classic cars from across the nation will line up will lie in the beautiful Cape Fear River for the 11th Annual Antique Car Show. The show features free live music, as well as awesome vendors and incredible pre-1980 cars. If you have any questions, please email into at rims, info at rimsontheriver.com. Date, May 22nd through May 25th. Place, Fonta Dam. Event, Memorial Day Weekend Summer Kickoff, starting at 10 a.m. and ending at 9 p.m. Get ready for a fun, for a full weekend of fun and entertainment and live music for all your family and friends at the resort. Choose from marina and watercraft rentals, outdoor adventure, pools and lazy river, disc golf and scenic byways, great food. If you have any questions, please call 828-498-2150. Date May 28th through 31st, Place Waynesville, Event Nonsense. Starting at 7.30 p.m., this smash-off Broadway musical comedy hits hit that ran for more than 3,000 performances. Nonsense kicks off admission. Admissions are adult $26, senior $22, students $13, and $9 for matinee. If you have any questions, please call primary 828 4 Four five six six three two two, or visit www.hearttheater.com. If these events weren't enough for you, or you are looking for something different to do, then check out the website www.visitnc.com. Under the upcoming events tab, you'll be able to sort and search for something that suits your need. It's time now for more your school news on the morning show. Let's send it back over to our news anchor, Rachel Blue. Thank you, Sierra and Britton, and welcome everyone to Your School News here on The Morning Show. Snipes Academy of Arts and Design students attended their annual reception held in their honor by the neighborhood group Friends of Snipes. The special gathering was held at Keenan House, home of UNCW's interim chancellor Bill Sederberg and his wife. We get this report from YSN reporter Bobby Blue. The shining stars of Snipes Academy's 3rd, 4th, and 5th grade classes attended a breakfast in their honor at UNCW's Keenan House for their outstanding academics and positive behavior throughout the school year. They were greeted by Interim Chancellor Bill Sutterberg and took a tour of the house. Uh, my visit to the house, it was amazing. This is a huge house and it was a great experience. There were um, talking about us, how about never giving up, and it was fun. It was great. Well, I think they have a nice and beautiful house, and I think that the, net, the people who built the house had a lot of, uh, they were very artistic. Following the tour and snacks, the students heard from three UNCW students about their pathways through school and their goals in college. One shared her experiences in international studies. The students were thrilled to discover she could speak French and kept asking her to translate words. Another student shared his experience as a college student majoring in English with a double minor in African and Native American studies while the third UNCW student amazed the Snipe stars with his studies in psychology. I learned that to per persevere and never give up of my dream. Um, I learned from one of the students is to never give up, keep on trying, and um, just go for what you're reaching for, go for your goal. I think they're um, good students and I want to be like them. 
This was the third annual Shining Stars reception, and the students were really excited about this opportunity. And what I thought about the house was it was very cool because, you know, like, I never got to be in the mansion before, and um, it was cool because it had five bathrooms and five bedroom and seven bathrooms and I never been in a house with that many like bedrooms and things like that. The event was made possible by Friends of Snipes, a group of neighbors in the Snipes district who call Snipes their neighborhood's school. While none of the Friends currently have children in elementary school, the Friends of Snipes recognize the significance of being involved with children around them. Reporting for Your School News, this is Bobby Blue. The third annual Teacher Trot 5K Race and Fun Run presented by Hendrick Toyota of Wilmington is Saturday, May 2nd. The event will begin at 8 a.m. and will be held at Ashley High School. Proceeds raised from the event will help support staff wellness and student physical education programs. The event is being sponsored by Hendrick Toyota, Ashton Farm, Pierce Group Benefits, Shaver Chiropractic, T-Mobile, and other supporting community sponsors. The Teacher Trot is a great opportunity for New Hanover County Schools employees, students, parents, and community members to run together in an effort to build our district's wellness programs. Many schools have formed teams and will compete for awards that include Most School Spirit and Most Participation. In addition, awards will be given to the top three finishers in the following categories, age groups, best overall, and teams. Registration is now open for new, the New Hanover County School Teacher Trot. Registration costs are $25 for adults and $15 for students. Race day registration will be $30 and will begin at 7 a.m. You can register online. For additional information, contact Jessica Elliott at jessica.elliott at nhcs.net or 254-4304. Recently, the Eastern Central North Carolina Regional Competition for the Scholastic Art Awards was held on the campus of Barton College in Wilson, North Carolina. The Scholastic Art Awards have celebrated 84 years as a unique presence in our nation's classrooms by identifying and documenting outstanding achievements of young artists. New Hanover County Schools competed against many prestigious schools and school systems from across the state. With a complete report is YSN reporter Dylan Grace. 21 Ashley High School art students recently earned over 60 regional scholastic art awards, including 33 gold keys, 20 silver keys, and 8 honorable mentions. All of the gold key entries went on to national judging in New York. Each year, 300,000 regional gold keys works are submitted nationally, and only the top 1% are recognized at the national level. For the second year in a row, Ashley had a national gold medal winner. This year, Addison Casey won the gold medal for her ceramic piece, Blue Striped Teapot Form, which was the only ceramic work chosen from North Carolina. Her work is now on display all month in New York City's Carnegie Hall. This year's Ashley Scholastic Art winners are Matt Allegretto, Madison Arthur, Zoe Batson, Gina Bonini, Erica Buchanan, Addison Casey, Sophia Copeman, Britton Dietz, Brooke Faulkner, Griffin Faulkner, Brianna Halsted, Halstead, Natalie Kazdan, Haley Kaisiker, Julia Koff, Summer Nicholson, Maxwell Rhinebax, Lillian Rogers, Amethy Sanderson, Taylor Sexton, Haywon Song, and Lane Thompson. Since 1970, Barton College has hosted the Scholastic Art Awards for the largest regional district in the state. Currently, with 62 counties from Winston-Salem to the coast, the Scholastic Art Awards provide the opportunity for teenagers to have their work exhibited in prestigious galleries and is the nation's most prestigious recognition program for artists and writers. Reporting for Your School News, this is Dylan Grace. That's all for now. To watch this week's edition of Your School News online, visit the School Systems website at www.nhcs.net and click on the NHCS TV logo on the homepage. Now back over to Sierra and Britain. 
Thanks, Rachel. We close our show with a new and exciting game we call Prevent the Poisoning. This game will test our knowledge of poison prevention. Let's send it back over to Rachel who will explain the game. Here are the rules. It's simple. Stay alive. I will ask you a question about poison and poison prevention. If you get it right, you continue on. If you get it wrong, your smiley face gets poisoned. Get poisoned three times and the smiley dies. We have 14 questions and we'll play until they are used up until, or until the first smiley dies. Can you survive? All right. First question. Which of these toxic substances is blamed for the most fatal unintentional poisonings in the United States? And Sierra, you'll go first. A, lead, B, carbon monoxide, C, B venom, or D, bleach? B. It was C, B venom. All right, next question. How can you reduce the risk for a child's accidental poisoning by medication? A, never refer to medicine as candy. B, keep medicines in their original containers. C, avoid taking medicine in front of children. Or D, all of the above. D. That is correct. All of the above. This is easy. <laughs> all right, next question. If your child eats or drinks a toxic, su toxic substance, what should you do? A, give the poison control center. Call the poison control center. B, give your child syrup of ipecac. C, wait and see what happens before calling your health care provider, or D, give your child milk. A. That is correct. You should call the Poison Control Center. Next question. How can you help prevent the accidental poisoning of a child outdoors? A, only let them play in the backyard. B, allow them to eat mushrooms. C, teach your children not to eat berries that grow in the yard. Or D, none of the above. C. C is correct. Do not eat berries. Five, a potential poison is A, a product that is labeled poison, B, a liquid that is harmful to children, or C, any substance that is misused. C. That is correct. Any substance that's misused is a poison. Next question. A cover designed for household products and medications which is designed for safety is A, pop top, B, child resistant cap, C, screw lid, or D, bottle cap. B. That is correct. Smileys are staying alive. <laughs> All right. Mine's a little Next gone. question. Syrup of ipecac is a type of cough medicine, or B, neutralizes poisons. C, should never be used without talking to the poison control center, or D, is put on burns. A. It's not. It should never be used without talking to the poison control center. <laughs> Next never question. <laughs> Still don't know what it is, but it should yeah. never be used without talking to them first. <laughs> Next question. How many children are admitted to emergency departments each year due to medication poisoning? A, 53,000, B, 71,000, C, 80,000, or D, 92,000? B. Yeah, B, 71,000. <laughs> My smell is like dead and hers is just happy. <laughs> <laughs> this isn't fair. <laughs> Okay. Next question. What is the correct number for the poison helpline? A, 1-800... This is... You're just going to have to guess. 1-800-222-2221 or 1-800-122-2222-2 or 1-800-221-2222. We're going to say that instead. And then 1 800 222 122 2. I'm going to go with C because C is always the answer. <laughs> it's D. <laughs> <laughs> the correct number is 1 800 222 1222. Probably would have been easier if I said it that way. It's okay, you were. You're, you're 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 dead. So <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah. Let's go on crossbones. She's all happy. What kind of question? <laughs> all right. Well, it looks like Sierra is not our winner. What's your name again? Britain. Britain. Britain's our winner. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot her name for a second. Congratulations, Britain. I would say good game, but I lost. <laughs> well, that was fun, though. <laughs> well, that does it for this edition of The Morning Show. Remember, for the best TV of all, each and every day, keep it tuned right here for New Hanover County Schools TV on Learn Network of the Cape Fear. Have a great day. And a wonderful week. <laughs>